I think an excellent politician. He was a man, without doubt, with an eye for the main chance. But as he consolidated his rule, it became clear that Pisistratus had far greater ambitions than simply gaining power. Pisistratus was an extremely intelligent man. He clearly understood that if he was going to maintain control of Athens, if he was going to be able to consolidate his rule and pass it on to his sons, which is clearly his ambition, he would have to find allies. Pisistratus took an extraordinary step. He turned to the common Athenians for support, undermining the whole hierarchy of aristocrats and commoners that had endured for centuries. Pisistratus reduced taxes and introduced free loans to allow the people to build up their farms. And by offering the Athenians the chance of prosperity, Pisistratus began to transform his city. With the rise of Pisistratus, we start to see the success of agrarianism accelerated at Athens. And that's going to be a kernel that's going to grow and grow and grow in the ensuing two centuries. And one of the results of that is we see more vines and olives. Olive trees manifest themselves in every aspect of Greek culture. Economically, they allow people to have cooking oil, they allow people to eat olives, they allow people to use lubricants, soap, fuel, so it's a very valuable economic commodity. The land around Athens produced excellent olives, the best in the Greek world. And as production soared, the Athenians found a ready market for this oil. not only in the other Greek states, but across the sea, in Egypt and Phoenicia, Persia and Assyria. Greece is in the middle of an extraordinary grouping of ancient civilizations. It's bounded on the east by the great Persian Empire, on the south by the age-old civilization of Egypt, on the west, the Etruscans and the Romans. Greeks were scattered. Plato has a rather nice phrase, like ants or frogs round a pond. The Eastern Mediterranean was the greatest marketplace of the ancient world. It seemed that everyone had something to sell grain from Scythia, salt fish from the Black Sea, wine from the great vineyards of the island of Chios, gold, silver, art, and finery from Egypt. And everyone was willing to trade for Athenian olive oil. As goods flowed in and out of the Athenian harbor, the Athenians found their wealth and prosperity on the rise. But the most astonishing consequence of Athens' sudden expansion was to be found in the darkest streets of the city. Athens' first great artistic legacy, the vase. But I think what, what's fascinating about the pottery is that in its own time, it wasn't a big deal artistically. What was inside the pots was almost invariably worth more than the pot itself. Here in the area known as the Keramikos, ancient Athens red light district, could also be found the potter's workshops. These common artisans were amongst the lowest of the low in Athenian society. If you were a potter in Athenian society, 
I won't say you were the scum of the earth, but you certainly um, had no special respect. It was hard, incessant work, unenvied by the citizen population. Pottery had been a staple across the ancient world for hundreds of years, used in the kitchen at home and for transporting oils and food. But it had always been simple in design, using geometric patterns and basic figures, designs based on Egyptian and Assyrian art. But Athenian potters, as they decorated their work, began to develop a whole new style of painting, a freshness and a naturalism never before seen, a style still astonishing today. It's now become almost commonplace for a Greek vase on the modern antiquities market to fetch millions of dollars or pounds. And if the makers of those vases had any idea of what we were shelling out for them, their graves would spin with either resentment or just absolute hilarity. These Athenian potters seem to have been motivated not by the idea of producing great art for eternity, but of outdoing each other. On one particularly fine vase, we find the proud comment, Euthymides, son of Polyas, drew this. And then underneath, And I'll bet Euphronius couldn't have managed it. For the first time in their history, the ordinary Athenians had tasted freedom. And they had shown their capacity for extraordinary achievement. Pleisthenes grew to manhood under Pisistratus' rule. And he saw how Athens changed. His home had turned from a modest rural settlement into an international economic power. Pisistratus' rule of benevolent tyranny was not to last forever. In the year 527 BC, he died and was laid to rest here in the Athenian graveyard. His son, Hippias, took over. At first, Hippias followed in his father's footsteps, ruling Athens with a fair hand. But soon, the Athenians discovered the perilous nature of tyranny. Historians tell us that in the year 514 BC, Hippias' brother was murdered. Aggrieved and bitter, the tyrant's behavior completely changed. Hippias not only executed the murderers, but cruelly tortured one of their wives to death as well.